Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar on gardening with lilies. My name is Lara and I'm the Community Outreach Director here at the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. Uh, I just want to say in a time when the best thing for our global community is to physically isolate, we feel grateful that we can continue to keep connected with you through this webinar service. Please keep an eye on our website for future online programming. Uh, we have a lot of new uh, programs and webinars in the hopper. <clears throat> just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You are attending the webinar tonight in listen-only mode. So you will be able to hear our presenter, but we can't hear you. That way there will be no background noise. If you have questions for our presenter, you can type those in on the panel on the right side of your screen. We will cover the questions at the end of the presentation. If you don't see the panel, look for an orange arrow in the upper right corner of your screen. Click on that arrow and it will pop out the panel. And now, please welcome our guest tonight, Will Doherty. Will is a retired landscape designer and plantsman trained, trained by Pete Udolph and Noel Kingsbury and former master gardener and Minnesota master naturalist. Tonight, Will plans to expand your knowledge of lilies. In this webinar, you will learn the botany of lilies and the types that work well in our continental climate. We will go over how to landscape with lilies and how to choose, plant, and care for these beautiful summer blooming perennials. Thanks for being here tonight, Will. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, happy first day of spring. One of the beauties of gardening is that you can do a lot of social distancing while gardening. So we kind of a little bit went a little bit over um, who I am. Um, I just simply want to stress a little bit about my background with the lilies. Um, I had an interest in uh, Hartle Gilman lilies. Uh, a local grower, uh, been a lily breeder, um, sold, sold um, lily bulbs through master garden events around the state. And uh, so I've had have quite an extensive collection as well as uh, my whole garden is just one great big experiment. And I I try different different plants all over the place. And of course, lilies are one, one of those that I uh, spend a lot of time with. The whole back of my house, um, is a uh, lily bed. I'd say there's probably 400 or 500 lilies back there. So it was really quite spectacular in this in the summer. So let's think spring and summer. So in this class, we're gonna kind of go over what is a lily, its life cycle, the parts of a lily, the types of lilies, those types of lilies that work well in our Midwest continental climate, the seasons of bloom, we'll talk about culture, planting, caring for lilies, putting lilies to bed and propagation. And then what I like to call the hobby, I see lilies as the hobby, perfect hobby perennial. They're easy to maintain, um, easy to grow. Um, they're excellent uh, plants for uh, hobbying, for propagating, for showing. And of course, at the very end, we'll have questions. So what is a lily? True lilies come from the genus Lilium. They're underground perennial bulbs. There are about 90 species across the Northern Hemisphere. Each one of those species has 24 chromosomes. They're noted for their showy blossoms oftentimes called the queen of the summer garden. Let's talk a little bit about their life cycle. In the spring, uh, the seed germinates with proper light, warmth, and moisture. We're not there yet. I do see my lily beds are being, the, the soil is being to crack open from the pressure, uh, well, with less moisture, but the seeds would not be germinating just yet. The seed swells and the seed coat breaks open. A tap root is created and a leaf shoot emerges. Now there are actually two methodologies for seed to generate, epigeal and hypogeal, and I will not cover those right now. We'll cover them a little bit later when we're talking about propagating. 
the cotyledon that pops out of the ground will turn green along with the, the green leaf, which leads to photosynthesis and immediately begins to put energy into the ground and into the plant. Um, the leaves will then turn, um, turning green will have, start to begin to process excess food, which is stored in tissues as a ball plate and as scales. When the first year growth wanes, um, you're not going to see a big, beautiful uh, lily. Now, you can break by pre-cooled lily bulbs, and those things will, you can put them in the ground in the spring, and they will bloom to you in the summer. But we're we're talking about the life cycle here. Um, as the first year growth wanes, the plant will start to perennialize itself, um, start to work uh, work um, to uh, winterize itself. Of course, the top growth will die back. Uh, roots will have been growing all this time, and it will uh, prepare itself for winter. When the plant reemerges in the spring, it gets ready to flower with maturity. It produces a hormone at the crate at the stem tips, which turn to flowers. And of course, the flowers will attract uh, pollinators, which will fertilize the plant, the ovary, will uh, swell and create seeds and restart the cycle all over again. These are true bulbs with a base plate. There's a, a tissue that from which all parts of the bulb originate. The leaf scales are wrapped around a growing point. Those are the heavy tissues um, that are grown in, uh, in pairs around, around the plant. It will develop new bulbs from that place and it'll develop a tunic of scales which will it'll toughen up. Here's an example of the underground growth of a mature lily. Starting from the top, there are stem roots that anchor the plant into the ground. Those can take place anywhere from just below the top of the soil all the way down to the, the bulb itself. Below that will be stem bulblets. As you see here, they're uh, growing on either side. We got two here growing on either side. Those will be future bulbs that can be harvested, uh, will grow onto new plants. Um, then we get to the bulb itself, which is uh, has a base plate that's pyramidal in shape, and the scales, bulb scales, will, will be produced from there. This particular bulb has an increased growing on its uh, left side. From the base plate, then also the contractile roots and the basal roots that uh, are sucking uh, energy from the soil enter the bulb. <laughs> I'll get that right yet. Okay, there are a number of different types of bulb growth. There's the concentric model. That is where what you would see if you were to start digging up most um, Lilies, the Asiatics are all concentric, for example. They have a common pyramidal base plate, which is sort of surrounded by scales. The stem will grow from the center and new bulbs from the side of the base plates. There are also a con fairly common as stoloniferous bulbs, which are like concentric, but they grow new bulbs are set out by a stolon or fleshy underground stem. El Canadense, which is some uh, one of the lilies that you may be able to to find in uh, Minnesota is a uh, typical of a stoloniferous plant. Okay, there are some other rare growth patterns found in some North American species. There are stoloniferous stemmed plants, which create a stolon with new bulbs and a flowering stem. They will actually, the stem will start to grow and actually will go either left or right or north or south. Um, the stolen will grow and will produce, produce new stems along its way. And then the actual flower stem will be at the very end. So that's the storoniferous stemmed variety. There's rhizomatis in which the, the base plate widens and the scales will develop around there. Typically these particular plants um, have brittle scales. So if you were to have a species or hybrid from species, that have rhizomatis, rhizomatis um, conditions, the scales will flake off on you. So you gotta be very careful. But these are fairly rare growth patterns. Then there's the sub uh, rhizomatis type, which have a concentric 
pattern with a wild base plate. And it, it's like suddenly the base plate decides, decides wants to go whichever way it wants to, um, and uh, we'll grow new, new bulbs from that. Here is an example of young growth, young Asiatic growth of leaves, not yet showing any flower bulbs or flower stems. Um, very beautiful in itself. Here's another variety. As you can just begin to see, you can see the flower, the flower um, beginning to uh, pop out of the top, the swollen stem tip. And of course, here's the example of it in a few weeks later. The flower, the parts of the flower, let's talk about that. There are the three sepals. There will be smaller in size. They're what hold the flower capsule as it's growing. And then there'll be three petals. Inside that will be the actual female and male part portions of the flower. In the top left corner, you see the male portion, which is made up of the anther and the filament. And of course, then on top of the anther, we'll break open the pollen. Keep in mind, if you're ever gonna grow and show or bring your lilies in, the pollen stains. So I'll show you an example later where all the all the pollen, the anthers have been uh, broken off. Yeah, it'll be difficult to get the stains out of your clothing. So all that is called, uh, the pollen, the anther, the filament are called a carpal. Then the other side here on the top right is the uh, stigmata the female portion of the plant, as it matures, it'll get sticky so that it will be willing to uh, accept pollen that um, some, some pollinator might, uh, might place on it. Then there's the style, and the very bottom would be the ovary. That's where the uh, seed capsule, the seeds themselves will be capsulated and grow. Okay, let's talk a little bit about types of lilies. First, we're gonna talk about martagon lilies which are one of my favorites and very popular in uh, Minnesota. It's also called the Turk's cap lily. It has an early bloom. It, this plant is blooming in spring. And it's also can be one of those lilies that can take shade. Matter of fact, I'll show you an example a little later of some of my martagon lilies in a shade garden. They're smaller flowers with, and the plant has whorled leaves around, unlike the Asiatic we saw earlier where the uh, Leaves are growing up all around the stem. These will have whorled leaves in a pattern, having some distance between the actual whorled whorl leaves themselves. They are very hardy. And they're called permanent lilies. Now, why would they be called that? That's kind of an unusual term. Martingale lilies, because they're hypogeal, uh, uh, hypogeal growing lilies, um, take a long time to actually germinate and grow to any type of maturity. Sometimes it can be to grow from seed to uh, a plant, a fairly mature plant. It could take 10 years. Now, the beauty of them is that they can last so long as they don't run into mischief of, of animals, etc. cetera. Um, we have colonies, we have known colonies of martagon lilies that are three to 500 years old. So. That's why you call them a permanent lily. You also can call them permanent lilies because you permanently want to leave them alone. You want to be able to, to mark where you put those bulbs in and just don't touch that area because it may take as much as three years for that bulb, for the, uh, the stems to come out. Oftentimes what'll happen is um, the first year you put it out into the ground, um, the following year, it may come up with a small leaf, as you'll see, and you'll see why, disappear. The next year, again, may I put out a couple, couple leaves. It may actually even get to be a foot tall and then die back on you. So oftentimes, it'll be three years or more before you actually have a plant that produces flowers. Beautiful plants. Typically, um, because they are so long, they take so long to grow, they're pretty expensive. I think if you could find them for $15 a bulb, you're in great shape, but some of these some of these lilies can grow be anywhere from 25 to 150 or 200 dollars a bulb. So they're kind of like a connoisseur lily, kind of like 
Champagne. Now here we have um, Mardigans popping out of the ground. This is very, very early spring. This is probably late April, early May. Um, you can see the soil type. It's kind of a gritty loam. And I grew most of my Mardigans on the east side of or underneath shade trees. This particularly happens to be these plants are popping up underneath an, an ash and on the east side of my my, pro my property. They do not like too much sun. Um, so they love um, early, early light of the sun and did not like that hard heat that you get in the, at the in the afternoon. Here we go, a couple days and they're starting to green up popping up. Um, this is the time that I, I, I got to admit, Mardigans have one big problem is that a lot of animals like to eat them. <laughs> so what I do is about this time, I put them in cages to keep the rabbits away. Now this is not, this is simply a, a small bit of uh, uh, chicken wire around the plant. It's still kind of open, but it's going to protect these uh, protect these growing plants from varmints. A little later still, you can see now I've taken off the, uh, um, the chicken wire. The, plant, the plants are looking gorgeous. You can see in the background, you can see that the hosta are now just popping up that this is a shade garden. Um, they're just now beginning to pop up and you can see how advanced that the martagons are. And here is a mature blooming. This is Claude Shride um, blooming away. You can see the concentric um, leaves up the stem. They will grow up very tall. They'll bloom from the bottom up. Um, hundreds of blossoms as the plant matures more and more. You get more and more blossoms each year. Um, it's like a candelabra effect of these down hanging flowers. And you can see now we've got um, the hostas in the background um, are uh, are growing as well and are now fully leafed out. You can see a smaller martagon that I just had planted in the ground down that place uh, a couple of years before over on the left side. Here's some, we're gonna go through a couple, couple uh, martagons here. This is Terrace City. Orange can be about, no, oh, I'd say four to five feet tall. Um, lovely plant. Uh, this is a fairly commonly available martagon lily. Yeah, you could buy these for $15, a bulb. Here's a back house hybrid. Um, quite lovely. Cranberry dancer. They comes in, they come in white, uh, whites. Um, oranges, golds, purples, pinks, a lot of beautiful colors. Here's two species. On the left is uh, the white variety of uh, Mardigan, Lilium Mardigan, and on the, the right is a uh, just a species uh, Mardigan with a uh, more uh, pinkish hue to it. They can get quite dark and purple. Your sparkler, if you like yellow. And again, most of these, uh, most of my martagons are in underneath shade. I have a couple of really large uh, oak trees and I have them on the east side of my oak tree. Here's the perfect example, a martagon underneath the oaks. Here's Claude Schreit again. This is guinea gold. You can see all the speckling and modeling. And look how vibrant the uh, the stamens are. This is towering delight. As you can see on the left, it is quite tall, probably about six feet tall. Uh, beautiful mottled pinkish red. Okay, now we're gonna switch to Asiatic lilies. These are the most popular lilies, the ones that are most commonly available. This particular plant, Landini, on the right, when it first came out, was incredibly popular because of its dark, dark purple to black looking uh, flowers. They are hybridized from many species. 
these been, have been hybridized for well over 100 to 150 years or better. They come in all colors except blue. They are the, probably the most durable for our continental climate. They multiply quickly, but they have no fragrance. Their blue time, bloom time is usually from end of June in through into July. Now they're sorted out by types by the way the, the flowers face. They can face, face up, out, or down. Here's an example, Kansas of an up-facing lily. Most Asiatic lilies are up-facing. They also can be side-facing. This is Bronze Queen. Here's another example. And they can also be down-facing. This is a very popular down-facing Asiatic called Citronella, beautiful yellow. Here's another one, peach butterflies. <laughs> I had a, I, uh, I used to do the uh, Bloomington Farmer's Market and I had a, uh, a blooming peach butterfly in a pot. And I virtually had a, I said I was gonna sell it, but I, there were so many people wanting it, I actually had an auction. <laughs> Auctioned it off to the highest bidder. Here's an outfacing embarrassment. All the dots about the, the petals and sepals. This is Connecticut memory. This has brushing, is what it's called. A brush of orange on the yellow. It's a kind of a yellow green. Here's dancing eyes. Dots and dashes. Ed Bruman. Now, as you see, though, you can see the variety. When you hybridize with from multiple species and from, from plants, uh, that where you have a vast, vast amount of uh, genetics, you're gonna get a lot of variety. And of course, we're in the next group we're gonna see, we're gonna see something totally different. This is Anita Gale, which is a down facer. First Lady, quite quite beautiful. Yellow centers with pink, uh, pink on the outside. This is Jacqueline. You'll see a large planting of Jacqueline in the future. Um, the one thing I really don't like that much is some of the earlier varieties here, like Jacqueline, don't have much, much substance. And they seem to um, have problems with the weather sometimes because of the heavy winds, etc. That is typical of some of the older Asiatic lilies. This is pumpkin pie with brush marks on it. That's a, a popular new trend in Asiatics is to have brush marks. Strawberries and creams where it's got a white, a red filling on white petals. Very popular plant. Buzzer. Now, the reason why I include buzzer here is it's short. It doesn't grow to be much more than 12 to 14 inches high. It has a great place in the landscape, which I'll show you shortly. And this is Patricia's Pride. Whenever I sold this, it was sold out almost immediately. But look at the beauty and variety, the beauty and color that you can get. That's the beauty of lilies is that that fantastic assault of color that uh, that you delight your senses. Next group we're going to talk about are L.A. lilies. Now, why are they L.A.? Because they are crosses of the Longiflorum, which is the Easter lily, and Asiatic lilies. Now, Longiflorum are not typically hardy in Minnesota. Uh, you, some people have had some success in a sheltered location growing Easter lilies on, but they typically don't last forever. But the Dutch wanting to create a new floral lily created the LA hybrids. It has an increasing color range because it's a fairly new type of hybrid. I'd say probably only been around for say less than 30 years. And they have great substance. 
and very large size. I call these uh, I call these uh, lilies lilies on uh, hormones because they they are preposterously large almost. Um, the substance. What can I say? You can, if you want to take and say that Asiatics are like lettuce, LA hybrids are like cabbage. They have much greater texture. Typically in storms, they don't wither. They will, the petals might tear off in storms because they have that substance. They have a long vase life. That's why they're, they were grown for the floral trade um, because you can keep, cut them in, bring them indoors and they'll last for quite a while. Some have fragrance. And their bloom time is usually mid June through July. Now, I did at one time I had a slide that compared an LA hybrid, an orange LA hybrid, to an orange Asiatic. I don't I could not find that, but to tell you that it's almost twice the size of an Asiatic is probably appropriate. This is this is a nice crimson, uh, chrome yellow called Pavia. You can see the size of the of the flower is quite large. You can see the petals on the inside and the sepals on the outside. This is Brindisi, beautiful pink. Now, because they are fairly new, and typically we're are we're first available for um, growing as floral plants, um, they were not experimented with quite a bit as as just landscape plants. So what I found over the years of buying LA lilies that some worked extremely well in uh, gardens and others did not do well at all. Now this is one that I've really always enjoyed. It's called eyeliner. I don't know if you can see the on the left side, maybe you can see that there's a really small red margin all around the petals. And of course here you can see the dramatic impact that a group of eyeliner can have. This is a, a masked bed of eyeliner. Here you go, you can see a little better. You can actually see the red lining on that plant. And you can see the beautiful contrast of the plant with another that we're going to go through, another uh, LA lily behind it. And that's this is it, Royal Sunset. This is really quite spectacular. It not only is a, wherever you put it, it's a royal sunset. In the sunset itself, it looks spectacular. It's a slightly, <clears throat> excuse me, a slightly smaller flower, but really floriferous. Grows prolifically. This is a, uh, what they call a salmon color, LA Lily called menorah. Maybe you want to call it cream. Here's a here's a large selection growing in a, in amongst uh, hostas. And here's red alert. This is as red as it gets. Beautiful plant. Talking about orange, vibrant orange, South Point. Here's a group. Now isn't that spectacular? Where all of you have yellow or um, yellow and orange Asiatics, maybe you want to replace them with LA lilies and get an even bigger bang for your buck. Really more, much spectacular. You saw Pavia, that's far greater in size and in quality than you would ever get in a, in a uh, solid Asiatic. Same here, South Point, big, beautiful, busting flowers um, in vibrant orange. Here's one called Suncrest, sitting along next to eyeliner um, with red speckles on a yellow background. This is Lituween. I, I've sold a lot of Lituween to people in churches who, rather than having, you know, might have uh, Easter lilies in dollars, will have, have Lituween, which is a big flower. This is probably eight inches across or more. Um, outdoors in the church. The next type we're going to talk about are Asia pets. These are crosses between Asiatics and trumpets, which we'll cover again a little later. They're long lasting, fragrant, usually trumpet shaped. 
They have good resistance to disease. They don't need any winter protection in Minnesota. And their bloom time is early June and July. This is creamy bells. And as you can see, they got a trumpet shape. Here's fiery bells, nice orange. Oop. Okay, now I'll switch over to oriental lilies. Of course, these are the superstars of lily world. I have a slight problems with oriental lilies. I love them, they're beautiful. They smell heavily. They'll overpower a room easily when you bring them indoors, uh, but they're short-lived in Minnesota. I once had an oriental lily bulb, oh, probably one and a half times the size of a softball, put it in the ground, it lasted two years. The reason being is that the bloom time is late, late July and through August, which oftentimes in our short season, our short growing season is too short for an oriental lily to be able to re-energize itself for the following year. So virtually what I tell people is that orientals are beautiful and they are so heavily scented they'll just knock you out, but only expect to have them for a couple years. This is a particular variety called Double Prize, which has um, nose on nose um, petals. Here's Esperanto. This is very popular plants, but again, probably better farther south than the good, good, old, good old continental climate here in Minnesota. Painted charm, huge flowers. White stargazer, I thought you showed this than the regular red stargazer. Now I'll talk about orient pets. These are crosses of oriental lilies. This is what you really want if you really want to grow something that looks like an oriental lily that has the fragrance of, of an oriental lily, you really want to find orient pets. They're fairly new on the market. They're strong growers. They have that same great fragrance that you would uh, get out of an oriental lily. And oftentimes they're commercialized as tree lilies. Why is that? Because they are huge. These are plants that can grow into large clumps that are seven, eight feet tall. Their bloom time is July and through August. This is American. This is a variety called American West. These are very hardy and can regrow year after year after year in Minnesota and in the upper Midwest. This is Indian Summer. Some of the plants are are out facing and upright, and some of them are down facing. This is Red Dutch. Because they are fairly new, they don't have. Um, the vast variety of color and form that you would get in an Asiatic lily. Sea treasure. American spirit, huge. This is like a um, nine inch flower. Then there are Arillian lilies. These are easy to grow from seed, which is, well, we'll talk about seeding for a little while. They have wonderful fragrance. Fellows are more flared, they have huge flower heads. Oftentimes they need to be staked. Unlike the Orient pets that can handle, uh, have large stems, these are a little bit more, um, well, weather can knock them down easily. And you need to winter mulch these. They bloom uh, in August, July and August. This is white Henryi, Henryi being a species. Heart's Desire, Louis the Fourteenth. And then there's trumpet lilies, growing tall, very fragrant, stately flowers, huge bulbs. They also need staking oftentimes. Um, you do, this is another one you wanna mulch in the winter time. They bloom in July and August as well, uh, throughout summer. This is amethyst temple. Anaconda, you can definitely see where they get the trumpet. Golden Splendor, out facing, up facing. And of course, there are a number of species lilies that are commonly available. Uh, two that are native to Minnesota are L. Uh, Lilia Michigan, Michigan Ansi, and 
Philadelphicum. One is a uh, prairie plant. I believe that's Philadelphicum in Michigan's. Oh, I got them reversed, I think. And one is a woodland plant. Uh, Philadelphicum can be about six to eight feet tall. Here's another one, Oratum. Now, this, these are things that most um, real aficionados will will grow. These hybrids, Bellingham hybrid. This is Canadensis variation, rubrum, down facing. Amabile, another down facing flower. In this case, it's um, actually there's varieties in orange and in yellow. Doricum, which comes from uh, Siberia. Okay, so now we know the types that grow well in Minnesota. You notice I didn't talk about tiger lilies. Many people grow tiger lilies. My problem is, is that tiger lilies are vectors for the uh, mosaic virus in lilies. So oftentimes you can grow them, but notice, know that they are immune to mosaic virus themselves, but will spread it all around your yard. And if you're growing many, many, many different types of lilies, it's best you forget about tiger lilies. Now my neighbor, when I, the first house, I saw, first house I bought, her entire backyard was landscaped with tiger lilies. Quite gorgeous when they bloomed. Here is a eyeliner in amongst a bunch of perennials. Got a, well, many lilies actually are meadow plants. Um, Mardigans, for example, will have a number of different character, number number of different places they grow. They can grow on mountain tops as well as into uh, um, woodlands. But here's an example: tall, creating a back backdrop in uh, in this garden. But there's a number of different types of landscaping ideas, different things you can do. They can be used in patios as potted plants. You can use the potted plants to, if you got a boss bare spot in your in your landscape, you can pop a couple of plants, uh, potted plants of lilies, and they'll provide color for quite a while. Here you see a potted plant on uh, the steps to a patio, quite small, just like the buzzer we saw earlier. There are a number of varieties out there that are still have small stature. So obviously, they can be naturalized in meadows and in woodlands. They look great in masses, as you've seen already. They can create uh, interest in any border, and they can even grow in the rock garden. Here, for example, is uh, a mardigan lily growing amongst uh, Actia, or what can also be called Simisafuga. I collect Simisafugas. There's a number of varieties here of, of species and hybrids. And I've got Mardigan lilies. Um, you don't see the white L. Mardigan album, but you do see just Lilia Mardigan growing amongst them. Those are fairly young, new plants. Uh, it's been like maybe three years in that location but really quite beautiful, providing color to, to that area. And of course, there's masses in beds. Here's two examples of my back, uh, the back of my house. Uh, on the right, you see uh, LA lilies. You can see how spectacular they look. And on the left, some Asiatics. Jacqueline and another brushed variety up, up above that. But uh, you can also see I've uh, put some uh, philictrum in in the background of the of the lilies to provide some additional plants in there. Now we will talk about culture. I oftentimes it is said that lilies need to have their feet shaded or shadowed or covered. Um, but here, the amount of plants that are in here. Um, do shading quite well all on themselves. So I've never had any problems. I have added some geraniums, um, hardy geraniums and other things to the base of these uh, plants. But as you see here, it's just all lilies, masses of lilies. Here's another mass. In this case, uh, a white LA lily with a D 
the purple Asiatic. Now, rock gardens. The reason why I have this plant in here is I don't have any pictures of lilies and rock gardens, but I do have this picture to talk about scale. These are um, standard dwarf bearded iris and sedum in amongst rocks. My rock gardens, the rocks are never particularly large. The largest rocks I put are in my garden are as large as I can carry. Now I'm a big man, so I can get some fairly large rocks in there, but everything is to scale. As you can see the scale, there's scale to the rocks. If you're gonna grow lilies, and many lilies will do quite well in these conditions, they need to be small. They need to be the plants that we saw, like those that were sitting on the stairwell. So let me just go stroll through, looking at some of the varieties of lilies and some of the, let you think about the things you, where you could put these type of plants. One of the things I've always wanted to do is take some lower growing, growing ornamental grasses and post them around clumps of lilies so that you can see the um, lilies masked by the tops of the flowering ornamental lilies. I always thought that would be a fabulous thing to do. Just don't have the room to do it right now. Now that's a mass for you. Okay, let's switch to lily culture. Lilies virtually grow from th from zone three, which would be uh, Southern Canada to zone eight, which is um, short of Texas and Louisiana. We're gonna talk about their light requirements, their soil requirements, their planting depth, mulching, fertilizing, pest control diseases and after bloom. So it's, uh, we're gonna talk about quite a lot here. So they take at least eight hours of sun. There are some exceptions, martagons are one. They like to have their feet shaded. Typically what I tell people is don't buy one or two lilies, buy four or five or six. Uh, they look best quickly that way. But if you wanna shade, their, shade the feet of the plant, you can use ferns or primrose, violets, any shallow rooted plant. Um, Herricks, rushes, sedges, we are also an extra one. The soil requirements, lilies like lots of humus and gritty soils. A lot of people will take, a, take humus, or old black gold and put leaf mold or compost or sand, perlite, vermiculite. They also need to have good drainage. What I, that backyard behind my house, it's a raised bed so that the water can drain off quickly. If it doesn't, then you have serious problems with the bulbs rotting. Or you can plant them and plant them in mounds, plant them on slopes. One thing is kind of essential is do not compact the soil. Keep off the space where the lilies are. Compact it too much and you're gonna kill your lilies. Planting depth, lilies like raised beds, so must have good drainage. So you wanna plant, typically the, the rule of thumb is to plant three times as deep as the diameter of the bulb. They will seek their own depth. So at first they can actually drive themselves into the ground. Mulching, you can obviously use ground covers. In the winter, we've talked about a few that, uh, that like to be covered, which you would do with straw or pine needles or leaves after the ground freezes. In the spring, you wanna definitely check to see to get that, uh, Mulching off, just watch for the brittle roots that are pop, shoots that are popping up, typically uh, about the time of a late frost or our last frost. Fertilizing, um, they really don't need a lot of fertilizing. They'll tell you what they, when they need fertilizing. Um, nitrogen, when leaves are, are growing is generally low. Phosphorus for bloom in the bulb and potassium for the bloom in the bulb. Um, if you're gonna use liquid fertilizers, like 20, 20, 20, keep it off the foliage, aim at the ground beneath the feet. Now, slow, repeat, slow release pellets is usually what I do. Um, I do them so at once in the year, usually in the early part, like in May. Uh, after bloom, you wanna 
deadhead the flowers, the stalks of the flowers. If you do not like the, the stalks popping out of the snow. Otherwise you want to leave them green and then uh, cut down the stems with as they die. I usually go, in fact, most of half of my lilies, I, I terminate to the ground and half I wait, stick around and do it now. I just got through actually cutting down old stems the last couple of days, um, just because I like the winter interest that they provide. Diseases, botrytis uh, is a co fairly common disease. You want to use Bordeaux spray, but more, most importantly, you want to have a clean cultivation, letting light and air um, come in and you want to dispose of the, the old stalks. The lily mosaic virus, you'll know when it has it. Um, the change of the flowers will actually change color. It'll get mottled and, mottled and um, mixed up. The turkey, the tiger lily is a vector and it's usually spread by aphids. There are a couple sprays that you can use for control. I just destroy the bulb. I don't want it to, to go spread to others. Another common disease will be basal rot that usually comes from uh, poor drainage that kills the bulb. Pest control, there really are very few pests. Um, well, you saw me put uh, fencing around rabbits. After they get to that, that stage where they're beginning to leaf out, I take it off because the, rab the rabbits don't touch them. But as they're first coming up out of shoots, when there's a lot of other things, uh, not a lot of other things to eat, they'll eat them. Mice can be a problem. Lots of little critters, voles, moles, typically can kill roots and stuff. Deer, deer love them, unfortunately, and aphids is a common problem. But again, we talked about Bordeaux spray um, to control them. Let's talk about propagation of lilies. Here we see a Mardigan seed with a Mardigan lily. You can propagate from seed, from division, from stem bulblets that we saw in uh, the picture about the bulbs. Ball bills, which we haven't discussed. Ball bills um, are little bulblets that are created at the leaf axils of some plants. Um, some Asiatics, tiger lilies, will create ball bills. Um, they just look like little, small, little, usually they're purple or brown, and they will grow roots and leaves. And typically, what they'll typically do is uh, fall to the ground and dig themselves in, but you can actually harvest them. And uh, what I've done in the past is actually create a special nursery bed for them and sprinkle them underneath the, uh, the soil a couple of inches, a couple of inches. And of course, then there's scales. We'll talk about that as well. But it's all a way to create new plants to share with other people. Let's talk first about natural division. You dig those bulbs up, you'll get concentric rings of, of uh, bulbs. Here's a tray of about, oh, probably about eight or nine bulbs that have been sitting in the ground for a few years. Just cut them apart, replant them, share them, give away. Just make sure you don't break the roots off. Usually what I do is I dig up a clump and I'll take uh, the hose and water and gently shake all the, shake all the uh, soil off. Now, seed. There are two types of seed germination. Epigeal, which takes one year. The plant germinates, sends up a leaf. Well, first the cotyledon leaves and then the actual leaf and will form a, a bulb. And usually Asiatic and trumpet hybrids are like that. Then there's hypogeal, which requires a warm period followed by a cool period. The forms and the leaves form underground. It sends up the leaf, the leaf up later, and it's a very slow process. Here is both Asiatic and um, Mardigan lily seeds that I collected for more for one yeast one summer. And of course, here you can see the seed capsules below. Now, epigeal, um, you want a, sh a moist mix, plant the fresh seed on top, cover with an inch of mix, cover with plastic and keep around 70 degrees. It germinates in roughly 18 days. You want to keep them damp. 
Yeah, these we're talking about seed that is just harvested, right? Not rather than keeping it around. Don't let the container dry out, and after a year, transplant them. Mixes of some people use vermiculite or perlite, sphagnum moss, pumice, or sawdust. I've used sawdust; works quite well. You want to keep it just mod moderately wet. Then there's hypogeal. There's a number of processes for for doing hypogeal um, bulbs. You can or seeds. You can directly sow them. Uh, you can sow them in baggies or into glass jars. They usually require three months of warm 70 degree weather and three months of cool 40 degree weather. Um, I'm showing here the book uh, Mardigan Lilies, which is available from the North American Lily Society. That gives you, a, if you're interested in growing Mardigans from seed, we'll give you a couple different examples. Here's the actual demonstration. We started with the seed, then it'll grow a short, a short uh, anchor. Um, the epigeals will uh, anchor into the ground and the cotyledons will then pop up and then it will also then grow a true leaf. That'll all happen in one year. Hypogeals, um, we start with a seed, it'll grow a small little ball band uh, uh, roots in the first year, first year. The second year then, um, it'll also then begin to grow a true leaf and the true leaf and not the cotyledon, the monocotyledons uh, will grow and pop up. That'll usually happen in the second year. And that may be all that you see is one leaf the first year. You'll see maybe a larger, better plant in two to, or three to four years. Then of course, what you can do is you can scale. What you're doing is taking the bulb out of the ground and you saw the scales on the, side, the sides of the bulb, creating all around the bulb. What you want to do is you want to break them off gently, trying to get a little bit of the base plate as well as the scale itself. Put them in baggies with, uh, with peat moss, put them in the refrigerator over the winter, and you get little bulbs. You can see here to the right, barely through there, you can see uh, bulbs that are uh, growing, um, showing their, uh, their first uh, cotyledon stems. Uh, on the right, you can see a bunch of martagon um, scales that, have, that are beginning to grow. But this is what you're going to get after the first, usually typically an epigeal plant, um, you're going to see scales like this after um, bulbs from scales like this. Let's talk a little bit about hobby hobby plants. We talked, I should said that lilies are fabulous. It's, they're beautiful cut flowers. Um, they are excellent plants to uh, show as well. So here's a design at one of the uh, North Star Lily Society um, shows. As you can see here, you can see that there's no pollen heads, no anthers. They've been taken off. And all you see is the filaments around the flower, um, as I said, because they stain. Stains are bad. Here again on the left is another display of stargazers. And on the right, on the horticultural portion, is a martagon. Now here, as you can see, the pollen-bearing plant, the pollen-bearing part is uh, kept on because you're displaying the whole plant. Here's a couple of more uh, horticultural displays. Look how black that martagon hybrid is on the right side. That was grown from seed. Okay, I want to talk about a little bit about the North Star Lily Society. Uh, they, our local, our, our local lily society, they have bulb sales twice yearly. They'll have shows, a number of shows. They have many educational meetings and seminars. Their uh, web address is northstarlilysociety.org. Of course, they are part of the North American Lily Society, which had a had a show here. Um, this is a common place for the North American Lily Society to have shows. They have a four color quarterly bulletin. They have a seed exchange. They have an annual meeting and lily show. We've had some local uh, people exhibit at the North American Lily, lily Society and, and one best of show. They have a lending library for member use. They fund lily research through a research trust. They have an annual lily popularity poll if you want to keep up to date on what are the latest and greatest and their annual dues are $25. 
Um, their site is called lily.org. Okay, if uh, we have questions, uh, we can offer the questions at this time. Well, wow, that was an awesome presentation. I well, love you. lilies, they're so wonderful and fascinating. Yes, they uh, are. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, let's see here, the first one, um, you mentioned cutting the stems down in fall of uh, lilies. Yes. And the question is, um, do lily stems provide habitat for native bees if they're left? Typically at the end of the season, I'm not aware if they use the stalk at all. I've okay. never, I've not opened up a lily stalk and seen any, um, any insect at all, to tell you the truth. Okay. I still have some to do so, but uh, I have not. You, typically most people cut them down uh, and dispose of them. I'm right. kind of a rarity in that respect. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I know a lot of information coming out of the bee lab is to leave stocks Absolutely. and stems and such. Yep, um, and that's what I do. I, I, I don't cut down. I just have a still and will not be cutting my garden down until probably May. Right. So, Yep. And then even composting them and not breaking them up. So if something's still in well, there, I do, I do take the lily stems and dispose of them because they may have viruses, et cetera, et cetera, in them. So I dispose of them. But everything else in my garden, I compost. I don't, I don't believe in uh, taking all that nutrient away from from the ground. And as you've said, said, um, I have a bee garden. I mean, I've had a bumblebee garden for probably half a decade. And I attract bumblebees and other types of insects. And I know they're they're living underneath those leaves. I, I generally have oak leaves all about and and don't want to disturb them. So yeah. I, I grow a lot of plants that are bumblebee um, friendly, spring and fall. Hmm, cool. That would be an interesting class too. Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question here. Um, does removing pollen extend the life of the flower? No, it does not. Okay. Not really. It just, it, it's uh, it's not a requirement. They, they will last without the pollen. Okay. Um, and then the final question, uh, do you have a lily variety cheat sheet? A cheat sheet. <laughs> of the best um, locations and the North American, I mean the the North Star Lily Society has um, a really good cheat sheet for some of those very lilies do extremely well in Minnesota. There have been a number of growers um, throughout the decades. Uh, as I said, the North American Lily Society commonly has shows. Um, the North Star Lily Society I know has some excellent. Um, cheat sheets uh, mm. for lilies, what grows extremely well, what's popular, what's been hybridized in Minnesota, et cetera. Mm, okay, we'll check out their website. Uh, one more question. Oh, we got a couple of more questions jumping okay, in here. Okay, sure. Um, what is a simple way to identify different types of lilies? Um, best way to identify. What is a simple way to identify? That's a hard thing to do. In some degrees, all the flowers look the same uh, in, in general components, right? You will, Asiatics are smaller plants with smaller flowers against LA lilies, which are very, very large. Uh, LA's are not all that common. Asiatics, if you're gonna find Asiatics, find lilies in your uh, local nursery, they're gonna be Asiatic lilies. They should mm. be pretty well marked. Um, she added more, more information to her question here. She oh, sure. means when you've lost track of your tags, what's a oh. good way to... Oh, that's a good question. Out? We're talking about thousands of hybrids. So <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would just write them down ahead of time. So if you lose that tag, you've got at least a, a starting point. That's, that's the problem I have. I hybridize lots of different um, irises and I lose tags and... Mm -hmm. I write them down on a list so I, at least I know what was growing in that particular area and then I can help to identify them. But there are so many varieties uh, of lilies that it could be difficult, but there are also a lot of sources where you can look and see. So not only does the North American Lily Society have a, have a 
listing of commercial growers. So does the, I think the North Star does as well. So you can peruse through the growers and and see some that something that you might have. Mm, yep. Okay, one more question. Can Bordeaux spray be also used on peonies? I'm not mm -hmm. aware of that. I'm not going to hazard a guess on that one. Okay. I believe it can. But yeah. You can obviously you're going to get Bordeaux spray um, at a local nursery, um, and it should be on the list what it can be used for. So. Yeah. I'll show you two different types of ornamentals that Bordeaux spray can be used on. Okay. Okay, sounds great. Um, well, this was fascinating. Thank you so much, Will. Okay, and well, I've got one more slide here myself. Oh, okay. I want to thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if a man finds himself with bread in both hands, you should exchange one loaf for some flowers, since the loaf feeds the body indeed, but the flower feeds the soul. Mm, love that. So thank you all very much for attending. Thank you. Um, and if anyone has questions, um, you can email myself. Um, I uh, my, my name is Lara and I'm on the website, my email address. Um, any questions for Will, you can send them my way and I can forward them to you, Will. Does that sound okay? I certainly can. Okay. Um, and then let's see, when you leave tonight's webinar, um, you will receive a survey. Uh, if you could fill that out, um, that's much appreciated. And on behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society and our presenter, Will, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very have much. A, have a great evening and be safe, friends.